Live from the House of LeMay Makeup and Dressing Room. Here comes Amber. Stop what you're doing. Here comes Amber. She's just doing what she can. Here comes Amber. Cue the spotlight. Here comes Amber. With two drinks in her hand. The matriarch of fashion. Sequence to her glasses. You can't look away. Ask her, does she do it? Really nothing to it. She's got that fan on the game. If you have a party, or if you're feeling naughty, call up the house of the maid. Ladies and gentlemen, please turn off all cell phones and get ready for your host, Amber LeMay. Hey, 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 happy LeMay Day. It's May 1st. But first, I want you to like, share, and subscribe before we start this week's show. Have you done it? Great. Let's go on with headlines. So what are you doing this Wednesday, May 4th? Well, according to the makers of Tropicana Juices, you should be preparing your mind and cereal bowl for an unforgettable experience. That's the day Tropicana is debuting their new Tropicana Crunch, the first breakfast cereal made for orange juice. Now, apparently, there are people who have made it a habit of substituting OJ for milk to pour on their morning bowl of fruits and grains. Not sure if this is from being lactose intolerant or just being weird. But Tropicana saw a niche in the breakfast nook and is going after it. Tropicana Crunch is touted as the first ever breakfast cereal created to pair with Tropicana Pure Premium so you can sip your sunshine and eat it too. This unusual cereal is made for OJ. will only be available through TropicanaCrunch.com. The juice brand will be giving boxes away for free while supplies last starting Wednesday, May 4th. We're going to have to order some and have a special edition of Lucy Bell's Bitchin' in the Kitchen. Now, following up on our story last week about North Carolina congressperson and candidate for season 15 of RuPaul's Drag Race, Madison Cawthorn, uh, was cited early Tuesday for trying to bring a loaded gun through airport security at Charlotte Douglas International Airport. This wasn't even Cawthorn's first time getting stopped at an airport for bringing a loaded gun, which seems like a pretty big thing to happen once, let alone twice especially for a sitting congressman. And when I say sitting, I am not referencing him being in a wheelchair. That would be mean. Add this to his accusing his Republican leaders of attending Coke-fueled orgies, twice being caught driving with a revoked license and multiple accusations of sexual conduct. Well, what's the response from his political party? The Winston-Salem Journal called it, quote, stolen valor. Madison Cawthorn lied about being accepted to the Naval Academy to get elected. Now Cawthorn's been caught lying about conservatives. In perpetual pursuit of celebrity, Cawthorn will lie about anything. An attention-seeking embarrassment. Cawthorn's antics help him but hurt us. Lying about conservatives, stolen valor. Madison Cawthorn lies for the limelight. Results for NC is responsible for the content of this ad. Oh, and did I mention he's received the support of Donald Trump? Did I need to? Now, this week in All About Amber, today I participated in the reveal party for the Vermont Association for the Blind and Visually Impaired's Dancing with the Stars. I'm honored to be asked back as a judge for this fabulous event that will take place in September. Today, they announced the participants. Local dance instructors were paired with local celebrities, and over the summer, they'll be preparing their dance numbers. I'll have pictures next week. And that's this week's headlines.
All right, we got more for the show. So, Russell, come on in. Let's talk about it. Hey, Amber, how are you? I'm doing great. We got Good. some new viewers tonight, so make sure you tell them what's the best way to watch the show. Well, and a happy May Day to all of them. And the best way to watch the show tonight is going to be on YouTube.com slash Amber Live. And why is that? That's for two reasons. One, YouTube carries us in full HD. And two, a lot of our viewers like to go over there, get on the chat, and not only talk to us, but talk to each other during the show. So you can chat with everybody and send in your comments and have a lot more fun that way. Make the show interactive. I do want to remind everyone that we have a TikTok channel, an Instagram channel, and a website. And that all has different things on it. So you can go around to get, get your full amount of amber at any time. So there's lots of amber out there. <laughs> That's right. And you'll be aware of on Wednesday nights when we do our amber chat. And we talk with people from all over the country, all over the world, and talk about what we have for dinner, what shows are we watching, and anything else that comes up in the news. So <laughs> Wednesday nights around 8.15 right here on Amber.tv. Uh, so come on, come on in and watch. All right, Russell, what's next? Well, <laughs> you're all expecting me to go into the bustiers, but this week and for the next five weeks, actually, for the month of May, we are having a pledge drive. So we're going to have Lucy Bell tell you all about that right now. Oh, shit, dude. Hello, I'm Rusty Peen, inventor of the Amber Pillow. Thanks to your support, you've helped make Amber Live one of the shows that you can watch on YouTube when you're tired of watching people pop zits or open boxes. Thanks to your support for the last two years, we've done over 100 episodes. And believe me, Amber and I are all American. But dude, if you really want to see my pillows, I won't hesitate to turn around right now, drop my pants, and show you what a full moon looks like. Here we go, bud. Yeah. We are currently experiencing technical problems. Please sit by. Okay, that's enough of him. <laughs> what Rusty is trying to say is that this is our pledge drive for support of Amber Live. We want you to become a part of the Amber Live family. During every episode, we bring you great interviews fun videos with the likes of Rocco, Rusty, and Emoji. And I have been known to teach you some recipes straight from the trailer park. Now, it isn't free to make this show, and we need your support to keep the lights on, pay the bills, and heck, we might even buy Russell dinner some night for all the work he put in. <laughs> but I doubt it. You can become a member of the Amber Live family by showing your support. When you make your pledge to the Amber Live it helps us to get even better guests on the show. If you donate $25 or more, Amber will send you one of her special limited edition headshots that she signs herself. You can take it right down to your laundromat and hang it on the wall. They love it when you do that. Now, for $50 or more, you will get the signed photo and one of our logo magnets. If you give $100 or more, Amber will make one of those cameo style videos for you. She will film a video wishing you a happy birthday or thanking your parents for having you or even a video of her sharing a vodka soda and chatting with you on, for those lonely Friday nights when you can't get a better date. Finally, if you give $500 or more, Amber will do a private Zoom with you for your event. Want her to Zoom your birthday? or show up on an office Zoom. Surprise your mother with the Zoom. You get all of Amber's zaniness for your next Zoom event. If you have a business, how about becoming a business sponsor? We can list your business at the start of the show as a sponsor and even start talking about it on the Instagram thing. And we can let the whole community know you are helping bring them great programming and amazing guests. Business sponsorship starts at just $500. Remember, we got that matching donor who is going to match your support all the way up to $500 of their own money. So please use our Venmo at RJD Pro or go to our website, amberlive.tv, and look for.
for that support Amber Live button to show your support now. Now, back to Rusty. As you can tell, Lucy Bell's very excited about this. And remember, we do have a, a secret admirer who is sponsoring this pledge drive. So for the first $500 that we bring in during the pledge drive, our secret admirer is going to match that. Wow. So that will double your donation. So be sure to give. This is a great month to do it. And we do really do appreciate all of you for doing that. Thank you. Yes, yes. So tell us about the guests for tonight. Uh, tonight's show is actually a really good one. Amber and I had a lot of fun recording this, and we did that because uh, one one person, one of our guests was in L.A., and the other one was in England, and so to match all the time zones, we had to do it sort of in the middle of the day, but we got it done for you, our viewers, and the show is all about Uprooted, a documentary that's on HBO Max, which Amber and I have both watched and both agree is really incredible and worth a watch. Um, oh, it, so it talks guess. about the history of not, not only dance, but also the, the cultural history, um, how dance has influenced um, what happens today. It's just fascinating. And I, I can't wait to rewatch re it. Yeah, it's it's a great piece. And it is worth, probably worth watching at least twice to get all the information in it. So our guests are the original idea person that started this whole thing and who did some of the choreography that's seen in the movie. Uh, and that's Zach Namorin, and he's in England. And then uh, Lisa Donmal Reeve, the producer, was in L.A., although she is British, but she lives in L.A. now. So we had both of them on, and it was a great, great show. So that's what you're in for tonight. Oh, the fascinating stories they had about the people they interviewed, how they put the story together. I can't wait. So uh, let's run the first part right now. As we just told you, we have a wonderful show tonight all about Uprooted, the journey of jazz dance. Here's a trailer for that film. People all over the world love jazz dance. They just don't realize that they love jazz dance. In the same way that no one owns jazz, no one's really making up anything that didn't come from someplace. A lot of the times the roots aren't acknowledged and a lot of people don't even know that the movement they're doing is stemming from that place. What was happening with jazz, dance and music here in this country was actually mirroring what was happening in the country historically, politically. Jazz is the history of America. It is that African heartbeat that has defined the style of America to the world. Doesn't that look cool? Let's find out how it was made. First, I'd like to introduce Zach Nemerin. He was the uh, he had the original idea and concept for the project. Hello there, Zach. Thank you for coming today. Thank you. All right. Thank you. So, Zach, first of all, give me some history. Who are you, and what have you done? So I know random Brit, random Brit on the panel today. <laughs> so my name's Zach Nemerin. Um, I have been a West End performer for almost 20 years and um, have done many, many different musicals with both um, British and American artists. Um, I've also worked in Canada for a little bit and, um, and also around Europe as well. And I'm currently as well as a kind of performer, I'm performing less now, but currently I'm a teacher, so I'm head of dance at a place called Millennium Performing Arts in London. You performed as a dancer, as a choreographer with those productions? I, I, performed, I performed as a dancer and a musical theatre person, really, uh, for almost 20 years. And um, I guess in the last 10 years, I've kind of, up to 10 years, I've kind of been focusing on becoming an emerging choreographer of my own right. I guess as well. Oh, exciting. What are some of their favorite productions that you've uh, performed in? Oh God, oh God, I just have to look around my room, but Chicago was one of my favorites. Um, uh, Cats, I absolutely adored. Saturday Night Fever, West Side Story. Oh my God, West Side Story. How can I forget West Side Story? Uh, oh, original cast of Mary Poppins, Legally Blonde. 
Carousel, Dirty Rock's Car- I'm looking around my room, by the way, because oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, how exciting! How That's exciting! Now, were those touring companies, or were they stationary in uh, in London? Um, I'd say pretty half and half. So I, I performed in the West End in a sta- in stationary company, so a West End yes. performer for just over half of that, um, and in trajectory, I've done touring shows as well, like you know. Jerry Mitchell's Legally Blonde, and I did Cats on on the road around the UK. I did Strictly Ballroom, uh, the new Strictly Ballroom, which uh, went to Toronto in Canada as well. So, oh, how exciting! <laughs> Get on that bus. <laughs> what? How did you come about the idea of um, this documentary? Well, six. Almost seven years. Wow, God, time really does fly, doesn't it? But almost seven years ago, six, seven years ago, um, one of my mentors passed away. Uh, also, our producer, Lisa Donald Reeve, knows her as well, as does our director, Kadifa Wong. Um, but uh, sadly, Jackie Mitchell passed away. And I suddenly kind of realised, oh, there, there, there are many people that informed us as performers, as creatives, as whatever. Um, who are beginning to 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 lose, you know, we're, we're beginning to lose them, and uh, you know, due to the natural causes and age and and what what have you. And to begin with, I kind of wanted to kind of document how how what it is that we do as a genre, musical theatre, dance, jazz dance, um, kind of has evolved over over the years, and and. You know, I did more research as I'm a teacher as well. So I did more research with Kadifa, um, and and we decided on this concept of oh, this was a very theatrical jazz kind of like lens that we were focusing on to begin with. And then Lisa went right. <laughs> we got in contact with Lisa Don Malreve, our producer. She went right. Can you tell me the story of the whole picture of jazz dance? So we did more research. I mean, I knew a lot anyway, but you know, there's plenty that I didn't know as well um uh, to my to my knowledge i was like wow this happened and this happened and you know it all goes through the the decades and there's a real kind of like time lineage that 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 of american history really that kind of runs parallel to jazz dance and and that was an interesting kind of um parallel to kind of run through for a documentary you had the idea, you had the concept, and then how did you meet your producer, uh, Lisa Don Reeve? <clears throat> well, I'll start a little bit further back. So it was me and Kadifa and I, so Kadifa the director, me, original concept, uh, and you know, helped everything else as well, But and choreographer. Um, so we had been working on it for a good ooh, two years before we met Lisa, and I suddenly remember because Lisa also taught at Millennium Performing Arts at the same time that I taught at Millennium Performing Arts as well in London, uh, I suddenly remembered, wow, I know somebody who is who is a new um, film producer and she totally gets it and, and, and has done our same journey as well. So we uh, were looking at very met various kind of like lots of different kinds of people to possibly produce, but then I went, right, Lisa, I remember Lisa Don Malreve lives lived in New York but she had just then moved to LA so we were in New York Kadifa and I were in New York and we were like right how can we how can we contact Lisa I'll contact Lisa and then we had a meeting and then she introduced us online to (laughs) Matt Simpkins who was our DOP as well um and we had a meeting with Matt at the same time on the same week when we were in New York doing a bit of a research kind of week there and it all kind of just flowed quite, and I hate the word organically, but it kind of flowed quite organically from there because we are all from the same headspace. We're all from the same dance background. We all kind of, we all appreciate the lineage and we all appreciate, you know, what what it is that that we have all achieved, but then wanted to kind of know more. And this okay, let's, of- bring, let's, let's bring in Lisa Don Mulreeve, uh, the producer, of this documentary. Hello there, Lisa. Hi, nice to meet you. All right, so what were you doing in London at that school that uh, where Zach knew you from? So um, going back even further than Zach, so uh, the three of us actually all originally trained at a place called London Studio Centre, um, which are the, the, the 
three teachers that then went on to cr start their own college, which is Millennium Performing Arts, taught all, all of us, but at different times. So we were never there at, or together. I was the elder. Um, I was there in the late 80s. Um, and then as I then went on to a performing career in musical theater as well, um, met Zach through the business and then through teaching at Millennium because of our kind of just, you know, paths crossing. And um, that I was teaching a, a technique called mathematics. So mathematics is an actual person. Uh, he's one of the codified kind of jazz people. Um, and yeah, I taught that for them for, for many years and tap. Um, and at the same time, was kind of still performing and then wanted to go to New York. And so that was kind of my journey. I went to New York first, carried on performing. And then that's when I kind of crossed over into film, started my own company, moved to LA. And then- What, brought, uh, what, what, what sparked your interest in film? How did you go from dance um, to film? I did some uh, on-camera on classes and uh, which I really enjoyed. I'd never really considered film. I was. I, I, theater person through and through. Um, and I think I was just getting to a point age wise and in, in my career where I was like, yeah, I'm not sure I want to be on stage anymore. I'm not sure I want to do that hustle. Um, and I just had this gut feeling of having my own company. I knew so many good creative people. I wanted to just create stuff with the people I knew. And um, I, I was listed as a producer on my own show reel, demo reel that I was uh, trying to get together of me being on camera. And when I saw that listed, a penny dropped and I was like, oh, wow, that's what that is. I think I've always done that. And I looked back on my life and I was like, I thought everyone had that skill set, uh, which I've been assured of they don't. And I actually really enjoy that. So that's why I was like, oh, OK. And then a friend of mine, Ben. Uh, ben Hartley, who is British but lives in, did live in New York, he knew I was starting a company. He said, oh, what about this? And it was a dance-based um, narrative, but he knew it was wanted to be film. And so then I was like, yeah, let's do it. And that's kind of been as soon as I made my first short film, which was with Matt Simpkins, who was the DP on Art Rooted, I was hooked. So that's kind of the journey. And actually, I'd only made that film when Zach and Kadifa approached me. I was in the process of doing two other shorts when we were filming Art Rooted, but even so, um, yeah, I love documentaries and I loved and thought I knew jazz dance. I was like, yeah, let's do it. I think this is amazing. Let's do the whole thing. Um, what, what's the main um, job of a producer? What, what, what do you do? Uh, <laughs> you kind of organize everything so you kind of especially an independent producer like myself so uh you connect with the creatives you make sure that you know exactly what they want and need and then you get to work raising the money scheduling bringing the people in crewing up um so that's kind of production wise um, and then beyond that is the post-production. So you, you basically, you, you, I mean, in, in the bigger world, you have a post-production supervisor, but we couldn't afford it. So I ended up just, you know, <laughs> being that too um, and learning that. On, on, I, I've, it, this film has been my own film internship. And I, I, have, uh, it, I was out of my comfort zone a lot, but I learned a lot, like a lot. What was um, the hardest part of being the producer of Uprooted? raising the money <laughs> That's a, i have somehow i thought that might be the answer it's always raising the money it's everything always. else is so much fun everything else i'm like yeah i can do that that's fine and then just wishing that i i will always say if i had a money tree my god the things we could make yeah. what was your budget for this well it moved kept moving <laughs> as <laughs> documentaries do because you go oh yeah it, we can do this for 200 grand, absolutely. And then you kind of get to a point and you just are like, huh, because 
the 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 more people you meet and then they're connecting you to the, to more people because the jazz community is fantastic um and then we were introducing us to more people and then it was evident as our story was building that what we needed and oh you know and then someone lynn simonson was like oh my god you have to come to the paris jazz dance festival and my brain exploded because i was just like how are we gonna afford that but as as a creative producer knowing that we had to capture that so you then go about going okay and you know we funded a lot of it ourselves um it because this was our first big film you go to your you know you go to your close people that supported you find people that really were very very invested in this and us and um yeah you just you just make it work um, but it's it's the hardest part. And I think any independent producer would say that it takes time to build that kind of financial network, which I'm still doing. Yeah. So if anyone does want to ever invest in it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, because my audience is is right for the picking right there. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much no. for giving a good foundation for the interview today. We're going to take a short break to take care of some business. We'll be right back. We told you it was going to be good, and there's more to come. But first, Russell, come on in. Hey, oh, my goodness. So good. Such an interview. And, and so much yeah. to learn. Oh, there is. There is. And uh, so, uh, Russell, but you have one more reminder? I do. I do. We have lots more to come in the show, including two more great segments of this interview. And then I want to remind people about our pledge drive. As Lucy Bell was telling you about earlier, the month of May is our pledge drive. And if you donate for the first $500 we get in, we have a sponsor who's going to double your donation. So now is the time. Yes, and thank you all. This is really important. This is a huge help to help keep Amber Live running. Um, and there is one other way, of course, and that's uh, by hearing from our sponsor. Every time I go to visit Upper Beaver Gash, I always think, why don't they have great shops like we do down in Beaver Pond? Well, now you don't have to leave the safety of your home and risk getting that pesky Beaver 19. You can shop at the Amber Live store right off the interwebs. And it's a better shop than Peggy's Plump and Proud. Oh, but don't tell her I said that. She's still giving discounts to the Beaver Pond players for the costumes. I like the great products like the coffee cups I drink my morning coffee out of. Or my evening beers if I feel like getting all fancy. Down at B&B Fix-It Shop, we use large Amber Live beach towels to lay out on the grass every day at 420. And don't miss the Rusty Bean Collection for all your peen needs, dude. Ditto on whatever he said. I just love their shirts and hoodies. Oh yes, if they have at the Amber Live store. Oh, they keep me so cool in the summer and warm in the winter at the Amber Live store. So shop at the best store in Beaver Pond, or better yet, stay on your couch, eat some pork rinds, have a beer, and order right now on AmberLive.tv. Thank you very much, the Beaver Pond players, and let's go with part two of our interview. All right, now we're going to continue our conversation with the original idea person, Zach Demerin, and the producer, Lisa Dodmo Weave, of Uprooted The Journey of Jazz Dance, a great documentary. So, we talked about how you got together to do the, the movie. So, let's talk a little about the, the history and the origins of jazz dance. Um, who would like to start off? Tell me, what, did, what is jazz dance? Um, that's the expert for this <laughs> so i mean you know i i have learned an incredible amount of information um through doing this film because you know when when we are taught um jazz dance or musical theater there's a lot that is actually omitted from the, from the history and a lot that doesn't actually get taught so yeah we may know about the cake book we may know about you know certain aspects of pat and juba we know we may know certain kind of like things that have been included. We may know about the Savoy Ballroom. We're more likely to know about the Savoy Ballroom. But do we know that all of those 
genre, all of those kind of dances. Do we really know that most of that came from West Africa when we're at college and when we're at schools and stuff? Did, did we get taught that? Back in the day, maybe not so much. More so now, hopefully, after our film that was played. <laughs> but, um, but, but yeah, so, so Black history and Black American history, I guess, runs parallel to the, the form jazz itself. It's like, oh, I can't remember who says it. Is it um, Jazz Dance is the History of America? I think it's Bob Boras. Um, he says that in our film. And actually, it is, it, it is really true. The more we kind of researched, the more we did more in-depth kind of like work in trying to find the lineage of what it is that we were trying to say, we realised that this, this whole black history that influenced and actually informed a lot of the art forms that we actually do today, um, we're not necessarily getting their platform or were not necessarily being spoken about enough if they were being spoken about at all. Because, you know, my, my, my original kind of like thought of jazz is if it didn't include rhythm, syncopation and dynamics and the use of isolation and um, improvisation, um, and have, you know, if it, didn't, it didn't, doesn't mean a thing, if it ain't got that swing type thing, um, it isn't jazz. But actually, there's more to it. It goes deeper. So I think we all, Lisa, Kadifa and I, went on a whole learning journey um, because it's not necessarily a thing that, you know, you get taught on the daily at colleges or at school or at whatever, because often the only information that is available to the general public, the Joe public, um, would be the information of the stuff that got codified. And when you think about American history, um, the stuff that got codified could only actually be codified by a certain type of person, i.e. .e. like a, a white male of the day, of the era. Um, because, you know, black people, women, they didn't have access to courts of law necessarily. They didn't have, you know, any rights. So that's, that's, that's kind of like half of the history of jazz dance is almost unwritten history, um, which I find really intriguing, and I think that it was. That's it really was. I, I really liked the, the you know the the thought, it, and it made sense that the original jazz dance was the African American slaves expressing themselves. That was one of the few ways that they could express themselves was through movement, and yes. so it created that, and it just evolved and kept growing as they had more opportunities. So you mentioned Cakewalk earlier. Tell us about um, how Cakewalk was developed and then I've got a little twist on that. So, I mean, jump in Lisa, if you want to, but Cakewalk um, was, a, was a form of dance used by the enslaved black people um, to almost make fun of their masters. Um, uh, it was a show, so actually it could be, and we kind of like go into depth actually about this within the film. Um, it was kind of like the initiary, initiation moment where a performance started to happen. So it wasn't just something that was done in the community. It wasn't just something that was done for, you know, for fun with your, well, for fun, I say for fun, it wasn't very fun back then, but it, it wasn't, it wasn't just done as a community kind of like dance, it was done more to perform to your, I guess, your white masters. And, and that's the kind of the, the initiation point where, where a form or many forms of movement became almost like, almost like a codified Kind of technique within itself because people were watching it and it turned into a i guess a legitimate thing that could be watched and could be codified and could be you know not that it was codified but it, it yes, could the, be. the slave owners would invite other area plantation owners and mm -hmm. have their their slaves dress up in fine clothes and the slaves would mimic the mannerisms and the dance steps that their white owners would do Exactly. And then they would get judged, and the ones who were best got a cake, you know. Wow. So it was, we're going to make fun of these people. They're going to give us cake, you know. So <laughs> who's the joke on right there? Exactly. Well, it's funny. Um, Cakewalk has a different definition here in Vermont. For over 80 years at the University of Vermont, uh, an annual tradition was the Cakewalk, cake with a K, 
And part of it was the fraternity boys would dress up in blackface and they would do a strut holding a cake and strut across the floor with high kicks and everything. And that went on for 80 years until uh, I think we have a picture that uh, of uh, one of the performances. Yeah, as you can see, there, there they are high kicking uh, with their black face. And that ended, and it, be, it was a social event of the winter here in Burlington, Vermont. And it wasn't until 1969 when they finally said, you know, maybe we shouldn't do that anymore. <laughs> I have a poster of the last um, year of Cakewalk. And for entertainment, Janis Joplin and Smokey Robinson and the Miracles were at a concert celebrating Cakewalk. <laughs> yeah, they have. They have been Oh, doing. my goodness. <laughs> so, you, you know, from cakewalk and then um, it just goes through society, how the dancing evolved and it even worked its way into Broadway. Uh, tell us how that some of that work and how that happened. I think it's a natural progression, really, because when something's good. It will get it will get used. Do you know what I mean? And and, and the fact that you can tell a narrative through jazz movement the fact that you can be possibly more emotive um through jazz movement or you could possibly kind of like make everything feel okay because it's kind of you know in, in a lot of people kind of feel that jazz and jazz music is uh, it remains in quite a happy place it doesn't always remain in a happy place i assure you but it, it you know it, it, it it's an uplifting feeling so so I think anything that is good will get taken and will get um, put into, into uh, a position that is saleable, really. Um, the problem with jazz dance is, is it being taken and, you know, legitimized? Are we legitimizing an art form? just for sale for a certain type of person or are we paying homage to what did come what came before and and where it all began and the people that started it really um so i think that's that was a a whole kind of angle that kadifa really wanted to 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 investigate um you know are, are things being appropriated for sale um for the right reasons and for the people that created it possibly and as this evolved, uh, it mainly I saw a lot of men choreographers. There was very few women who were doing choreography or listed or given credit for being choreographers in the 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s. And then uh, during the 80s, the AIDS crisis happened and um, a lot, something happened to a lot of those men. Can we talk about uh, how that affected the dance community? Well, um, I think I think a lot of a lot of choreographers, as, as we go into the film, a lot of choreographers and dancers alike just disappeared from, from the scene. And no one really, I guess, knew, could kind of get to grips with why. Um, you know, the AIDS crisis killed unnecessarily. So many, so many different voices that could have shaped what it is that we do today. In everything. Uh, in, in, in every day, not just in the dance world, but in, you know, in life, walking down the park, you know, we, or even forms of exercises, you know, we, we, so many, so many people passed away that could have developed our now history in, in, in such different ways that, that we will never know because it would have been their ideas, not ours. So, yeah, it's a, it's a, it's one of those horrible, horrible situations that, that I guess exposed the weakness of humanity, really. And, you know, just like the pandemic, it exposed the weakness of us as, as the human race, because, you know, we're not invincible. We think we're invincible, but we're totally not. And, and oh, deep. <laughs> going for hours about this. Oh, but... oh tell me, I, I I could talk to you too as well. Yeah, you know, but I always like to look on the bright side of things, being mm. silly optimist that I am. But didn't that open the door for more women to fill the void, and um, that's created a bunch of female choreographers or, or allowed them to be more prevalent than what they were in the past? 
so. one would hope. But I think Lisa, you should talk about this. I also think it's um, the women's rights movement too. I think, um, like with any uh, kind of decade, as you kind of really do study it, you see how um, society was becoming more open and like giving women more of a chance. But it still, I think, took till probably the 90s, I think, until the women, and there's still not that many. It's a bit like there's not that many female DPs that are recognised or they're just, um, it is kind of mind-blowing when when you really do dig into those numbers but uh yeah i do i i don't know whether the aids crisis actually had an impact or whether it was just at the same time the women's rights movement was building as well how about covid how did covid affect the dance community and any changes come about because of that anything positive i think it taught everybody i mean you it tests you doesn't it because i think people then have to you have to think outside the box so people you know i've seen uh like films done on zoom like people rehearsing on zoom like someone in a completely different space and that's how they rehearsed and it, you know people got it done people taught on zoom i know i taught on zoom <laughs> um which is not ideal especially if they're younger because you can't you know you know you can't go through the screen and you're like literally like that trying to see if they're doing it right um to help them it's uh uh, I think, I hope for me, it, when you then go back into the space, you have a renewed energy and appreciation of what you have. Um, it's a bit like I watched a live dance company last night and I haven't done that for a very, very long time. And I was just exhilarated just to, I mean, we were in masks, we were in LA. Um, but it was, yeah, it just made you, it makes you appreciate stuff more now. That's how I feel anyway. I don't know. I think it must have been very hard for, you know, especially professional dancers, athletes uh, to, to stay fit because, you know, you're limited, aren't you? <laughs> the couch got pretty comfortable. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but I guess we all, we all, just jumping on the back of what Lisa said, we all had to come up with new creative ways of entertaining ourselves or new creative ways of of devising you know for example you know we we all started creating online shows for colleges and all that kind of stuff and we would never have done any of that kind of stuff before before covid it was it was it was almost unimaginable that we would kind of create a, a, a an online video of the work that we had rehearsed online and put together online and <laughs> and then then share it online it's it's bizarre actually to think what we've what we have gone through and and i guess are still going through as well you know it's not over also, yet. I mean, thank god for technology you know right at the beginning i was like my god what did we do without zoom or you know, <laughs> or that skype but even so it just and having the ability to record that and edit that and you know go back to the Spanish flu, they didn't have that, you know. Mm. No, um, Burlington closed down on March 16th. I, I did my first show on March 22nd. Wow. <laughs> yes. I, 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 I was going stir crazy already. I wanted to do something. Right. And so Russell and I created this. So thank you. Uh, we have a, one more segment to talk about some of the, the film research that you did and some of the great pictures. And oh my God, those people you interviewed. So we'll be right back with the crew from Uprooted. Thank you. But wait, there's one more segment of the interview coming up. But first, people said, where was Rusty Peen last week? Well, he's back. Take it away, Rusty. Dude, time for another edition of Thinking and Drinking. I'm Rusty Peen, president of the Beaver Pond Guns and Tackle Society, and our mission is to arm more drag queens because a loaded drag queen is a safe drag queen. Dude. I've been making a shitload of these mini movies, these thinking drinking movies, and a lot of people have been writing in their comments uh, telling me what they think about the show, dude. So today we're gonna do Rusty Reacts Part 2. Dude, 
And this would be a good time to remind you to like, share, and subscribe to my YouTube channel. Come on, dude. I gotta get more subscribers and bitching and catching with Lucy Bell. Yeah? Okay, bud. Dude, Don rolled in and said, Rusty's just adorable. He reminds me of my fucking ex, who was an irreparable alcoholic who no one understood. Dude, it was that famous fucker who said, to be great is to be misunderstood. And that fucker was Emerson, Lake, and Palmer. Shaw writes in and says, Rusty, you are one very unique, and might I say, rusty individual? Dude, good luck on those fractions. As for me, I say no to math. I mean math. Dude, okay, bud. Finally, it's not just me, but somebody else doesn't know whether we're not supposed to say no to math or not, bud. Okay, dude, this next one comes from local newspaper, Seven Days. When they did that report on Amber Live for a hundredth episode, Jordan fucking Adams, who wrote the article, name dropped me and said that Rusty Peen is, quote, a hard drinking Vermont good old boy. Dude, Ma Peen used to say to me, Rusty, you're a fucking good for nothing, and don't you fucking forget it. So don't you forget it neither, Jordan fucking Adams, who's a good old boy, and who's a fucking good for nothing. Okay, dude, finally we got one more. This one comes from Mike D from Beaver Pond. Dude, we got a fucking local in the house, dude. Mike D was super stoked that one time that I fucking called out that Poison Ivy College, fucking Dirt Mouth College. Dude, a lot of people don't know it, but it was Poppy Peen's dream to be a disgraced scientist when he growed up. But dude, after just a semester at Dirt Mouth fucking college, they kicked him out. And after that, he was just a disgrace. It's unfortunate, dude. Dude, that's all the time we got for today on Think and Drinking. Glad to see your comments. Keep sending them in. Tell me your deepest fucking thoughts, dreams, aspirations. You can write it in the fucking comments, or you can send me an email at rustypeenisme at gmail.com. Love to know what you're thinking and what you've been drinking. Huh? Thinking and drinking with Rusty Bean. Okay, dude. Hey, Rusty. Always good to see you. Now, here's the final segment of our interview. All right, we're back with the crew from Uprooted, The Journey of Jazz Dance. We've got producer Lisa Donwell reed and the guy who came up with the idea, Zach Nemorin. Thank you, Nemorin. I'm sorry. Thank you very, very much. So I was fascinated with all the people you interviewed and the historical film clips that uh, you created and the pictures. Who was responsible for that? And how do you select what gets put in? Uh, good question. I mean, we all came up with, um, we kind of started with, okay, who do we know who can really contribute to this subject matter? And then you had also the book that kind of helped with our research and that inspired initially the story, um, Jazz Dance, The History of the Roots to the Branches by Lindsay Garino and Wendy Oliver. Um, they have separate chap chapters from like, dance educators and historians. So we reached out to some of those to get the educational side. And um, and then we went to basically our roots, our roots of uh, musical theater, for instance, Susan Stroman and like Jack's work with Jerry Mitchell. Um, yeah, I've worked with Cheetah Rivera. Um, uh, so there she is. And she, what the beauty of that was Cheetah was like, absolutely, I'll do it only if Grazie Emma can do it. And I was like, sure, absolutely. What, what? I, I, wasn't, I wasn't familiar with her. Um, um, not che uh, Cheetah, I know, but uh, who, yeah. who's the other woman? So Graziella Danielle is a very uh, established choreographer. So, and, and they've worked together a lot and they're, they're like sisters. So when, um, when they both were there, I mean, oh. Graziella is Argentinian. Um, 
Chisa, just it just I mean that was actually one of our first interviews or second interviews in the States, first interview in New York. Um I mean we just I mean it was just joy to be honest. And I, I, I love Graciana's story where she said that she was this you know choreographer and someone said she needed to go see a Broadway musical. She goes, Oh, I don't go to Broadway musicals. No, 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 no. She went to see Wednesday Story That's and story. said, I want to be in I want to be in yeah. Broadway musical. I want to be that. Yeah. <laughs> that was yeah. another thing. How many when they asked what was their uh, their, their turning moment or something that really turned them on west side story it was west side story west side story yeah. west side story yeah. that that was a cool moment and okay with, with the cheetah was pretty funny especially when she said she didn't know how old she was <laughs> <laughs> any other any other comments from cheetah that you'd like to share oh my goodness there are so many. There are so many. And and there are so many from a multitude of people. I mean, Mandy uh, Moore is hilarious. And and so so many people. Jerry now tell me more about Mandy Moore. What 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 would I know her from? Well, she's, uh, you know, she choreographed La La Land. Um she's on she does a lot of choreography on So You Think You Can Dance. Um she did the choreography recently on Zoe's playlist. Oh was i think amazon um no she was fun i really like her comments she's great and actually al blackstone introduced us so like connected us to mandy um and I, she, I mean you know she's a multiple emmy award winner and uh, just the nicest person and funny as oh, like, yes you hear yeah. me i hear me laugh off <laughs> and, uh, one of the stories because i was just like oh my god i wondered who that was <laughs> yeah, like, uh. <laughs> um, but she i i actually really she's like one of my favorite interviews um uh debbie allen was just uh, just oh, oh the debbie yeah, allen debbie. story um tell us about her um life as a young girl in dallas uh, Houston, actually. Houston, so, Houston yes, Houston. Yeah, yes. so she, um, she, I think she did a little bit of. She said her story that she did a little bit of tap and ballet, and she was outside the studio watching, you know, jazz, like what she didn't know, but it was because it, there was no segregate. All the dance studios were segregated. Yeah, you know, there so, was black dances and black, yeah, black dance studios studio and white. white dance studios, and no crossovers. Yeah. And she went up and was pressing her face. On yeah. a white dance oh, studio. Patrick Swayze. So Patrick Swayze is <laughs> in the dance studio, and she's actually the first person that basically integrated because um, Rick Odoms also went there too. Yes. And, yes. Um, I I loved that story. I think it's. Oh. it's well, you know, just so much. You know, it says a lot about the dancers and you know reaching out and bringing yeah. people in, inclusivity, also, which is actually what we wanted the documentary to be we wanted as many voices as possible oh. which um, you know isn't a formulaic for documentary you usually have a set kind of set amount or you follow a few people but we were like no we need these voices because jazz is so complicated um and complex um that we just wanted as many people as possible and so we didn't have that we wanted to be as unbiased so just let everyone speak let them have the conversation and that's kind of the beauty of it. It was amazing just hearing them all tell who was their influence and then go into that again. Mm -hmm. I had heard of some of them, but some I had no idea who they were, or, but just seeing their pictures, I went, oh my God, they must've been so, so good. Um, there was one, how many people did you interview, by the way? Or how many were well, featured? We actually in the interviewed film? over 80. Yeah. Over 80, but only 51. <laughs> made it into the actual film so we've still got a hell of a lot of information that you know is on on, on a card on a memory card somewhere um and that's over four countries and 11 cities and and it's 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 a real worldwide effort because jazz dance because it's so good jazz dance is so good it's so i think even mandy moore says it it's the everyman kind of like you know we we all have an element of jazz dance there and, and we can all do it so it's Oh God, oh, the fact that we've got so many interviews and I know as a fact that more people wanted to be interviewed for it as well, um, but we just didn't have the money or didn't have enough, you know, people. Yeah, the scheduling, time people you know, some people we wanted and they wanted to be part of it and then we couldn't get our schedules together and because and, we were limited financially, we had to have kind of blocks 
of when the crew was available, when Katika and Zap were available, when the person was available, when we had the money to pay for it. And oh, the logistics. I was seeing. Oh. Oh, no. Oh, no. Oh, I'm freezing up here. We can oh, yeah. we'll back. Back. Okay. I don't know what the problem is there. Connection is unstable. If you're on Wi Fi, I'm not on Wi Fi. Okay. Okay. We can find out. Let me get my train of thought. Uh, there is one person that uh, you interviewed that um, I'd like to know a little bit more about. And Russell, if you'd show his picture, please. <laughs> oh. <laughs> can you can you uh, hook me up with uh, Joshua? <laughs> <laughs> Joshua, the gas. I mean, and I love all the his interview clips. In oh. the just make me laugh. He just makes me laugh every time because he giggles. Um, oh. But you know, he's a big choreographer. Again, he's won several awards, and um, he choreographed Smash. And, and and then has done a lot of Broadway musicals as well. Um, our DP, Matt Simpkins, had worked with Josh. So that's kind of how we got that connection. Well, he yeah. said that he would, he, I think he said he would kill to be Sid Charisse's partner. You know, well, <laughs> so, so obviously he likes older, feminine, masculine personas. <laughs> I mean, look at her legs. Hello. <laughs> I've got good gams too. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll hook you up. He's a ballerina, but yeah. <laughs> I, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, one of the things, uh, I forget who it was, one of the people talking about how he was very regretful that so many students or, that he had or uh, prospective dancers didn't know the history and they weren't being taught and had no interest in learning the history. And I liked his example of teaching a step or a movement. And then, uh, I think, are we talking about, oh, go on, sorry. A step and a movement. Um, yeah, I think I. Well, if this is where um, it's like Parker S was saying, you kind of have to be responsible of passing the knowledge along. So it's the educator's responsibility to mentor the students, whether they're whether they think they should know it or not. Um, also, Jason Samuel Smith said you have to just keep, like, and Tom Rallabat said keep sprinkling that information as you're teaching. I think you're talking about Tom Rallabat. So he would be teaching a step that's actually, a, you know, an original kind of uh, vernacular step like Shorty George. Uh, and he said, and you tell them about it as you're teaching it. And so they're constantly getting that information that's keeping the history. So keeping the history moving forward rather than them forgetting about it. Yeah. All these people who mentioned um, their their idols or the people who got them motivated and all the pictures you've shown of all the studios. I, I, is there a dancer hall of fame, a choreographer hall of fame that people could go and learn about some of these people? I, I, there certainly is not one in the UK. I don't, I mean, you can go, I know you can go to the Lincoln Center and they have an amazing like archive library, but I don't know whether there's an actual Hall of Fame or a um, museum of dance. It just seems like yeah, it's, no, yeah. it's, I mean, it's so it's rich hard, there. Um, I don't. Or all, all those uh, studios that you showed pictures of, you know, the different dance studios of the forties, mm fifties, -hmm. and sixties. There should be a plaque outside of there, you know, saying this is where so and so taught. And you know, yeah. 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 In, in in like steps in New York, they have a lot of pictures, and so you know who's been there and worked there, which is lovely. Um, so I think each studio kind of does that. They do kind of carry on that legacy uh, for sure, but there's no specific one place that bring brings it all together. All right, so Untapped is now showing on HBO. Um, is that going to be its permanent home? Uh, no, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Uh, uh, no, no, it's fine. I've, I've rooted, uh, it's on um, HBO Max for three years um, at the moment, uh, just US at the moment. And at the moment, it's also kind of we're um, working on some deals to get it out to the rest of the world. So hopefully we'll have more news very soon about where, where like people in the UK and Canada and, you know, because we're getting a, we've always had a big outreach of like, where can we see it? Um, but uh, we're, we're, we're working on it and it's coming, it's coming.
Very good. What's next in each of your personal lives or your professional lives? Zach. Well, I guess, I guess, you know, Uprooted has its educational pack to keep it um, uprooted. Um, so there's an educational pack. So if you're part of an educational system, you can, you know, buy that or buy parts of it um, via www.uprootedfilm.com. Uh, <laughs> there we go. And uh, But um, for me, I'm still at Millennium Performing Arts and I have my own newly released in the last year and a half, uh, properly a uh, jazz company called the jazz core um in the uk so i've got a, a, a show coming up in may which i'm choreographing away for at the moment <laughs> how exciting how exciting and you um i am working on a few uh, projects i'm in post for another documentary that's a, um about this story that's amazing about this uh, celebrity chef called susan fenniger um so we're in post for that actually with the same editor as uprooted because the director of that documentary loved joan so much that um we we're now working with joan again so that's awesome um i'm raising money for two other feature narratives that hopefully we'll shoot this year. Um, and then we are, you know, prepping to pitch the episodic. So Uprooted, we want to expand and do like uh, an episodic. So, yeah. Ooh, that, oh, that, oh yeah, it needs to do that. It needs to, yeah. you know, I, I, I had to back up a few times because things just went by so fast. Like, oh, what, what yeah, was that? Yeah, and want to expand on stuff. And, you know, there were people that weren't available or um, areas that we just couldn't, you know, we wanted to go to New Orleans. We wanted to go to Africa, but we couldn't. So, you know, those are the areas that we'd want to uh, expand on too. So, yeah. Well, congratulations on a beautiful project that I, it's going to keep going. You know, it's just the more people see it, the more it's going to be shared because it's fascinating. There's not, you know, it's about history, it's about music, it's about dance, it's it's about like you said, American history. So it's very great. So thank you very much for coming on to Amber Live, and uh, the best of luck to you both. Thank you. Thank you so much, Amber. Thank you. More than welcome. Well, I can't thank them enough for spending the time to talk to us about that wonderful project. If you haven't watched it yet, go to HBO Max and check it out. All right. That's the end of the show. But, Russell, come on in. Come in one more time. Hey, Amber. Great show. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. So tell us who's on board next week. Oh, my goodness. Next week we have the man that interviewed you recently, Dark Mark from the Dark Mark Show, and he's coming in to tell us all about himself and the other side of that interview. Instead of him interviewing you, you get to interview him this time. <laughs> and he's been doing it for a long time, and he's got some fascinating stories, and I can't wait. Thank you very much, Russell. We'll see you next week. Thank you. Have a great week. Yes. Again, happy La May Day, everyone. Go out, enjoy, and don't forget, next Sunday is Mother's Day. Think of your mom. Bye-bye. See you next week. Bug, when we do this, do you ever get reminded of that butt doctor who was a guest on Amber's show? Should? What makes you say that? I don't know. I always feel like I'm getting a prostate exam. <laughs> you mean because we have a hand up our butts? What? Is, is that what that is? Um, I thought I was the only one. Ha! Ah! Don't worry, everyone feels like that after watching Amber. <laughs>